Okay, let's begin. Um, today's lecture is going to cover uh, some work that I did recently. I actually did it a long time ago, and then it came out, I don't know, a couple, few years ago in quantitative economics. Um, this is somewhat motivated by uh, a uh, famous event in uh, engineering history. Let me, here you see, um, you should see if you don't tell me, um, you see a bridge that's not exactly uh, functioning properly. And right now there's a car um, on the bridge and then, then it collapses. Now, since this is so much fun to watch, I will uh, repeat it. Um, now, this bridge is pretty famous. Um, this is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. It was constructed in 1940, as you might think from, the, from looking at the car. Now, uh, it was not designed to be an amusement park ride, but it turned into that. So what happened here? Uh, the, this is not the way bridges are supposed to go. And by the way, there had been thousands of bridges built in the United States prior to this that didn't have this problem. Now, from where I stopped it now, you see that the, the bridge, um, okay, it, oh yeah, total collapse, yeah, coming. Now, you see that the bridge um, is a bridge over some, uh, like a, um, a river of some sort. And so there's some, some vertical distance between the bridge and the river. And also there's some, uh, the, the bridge goes from um, a higher elevation above the uh, river and to some other high cliff. And so that's why this is called the Narrows, I guess. It's, um, so now the challenge in designing bridges like this is that you, have to, you want to design a bridge that stands up um, and takes the uh, weight of cars or, um, yeah, this is 1940, so there are cars on the roads, not horses. Uh, and you want to take the weight, weight of the cars and the trucks, make sure it doesn't fall down. And so that leads to a system of nonlinear partial differential equations talking about the stress on uh, the various components of the bridge. Now, the other thing about this bridge in particular is that the fact that it's has this um, uh, it's put in this geological context means that it has to worry about winds because when it becomes windy then the narrows kind of focuses the uh, airflow and so you can get uh, high winds now why did this bridge fall Um, well, one initial theory was that the, the bridge, you see, basically physical systems have what we call a resonant frequency. Um, and so that if, the, if a disturbance or if a shock on the system uh, has a certain frequency, then that frequency will be magnified within the system. I had an experience with that many years ago. I was driving down uh, a uh, rural um, express, express, not a freeway, but, ex, but a, a four-lane highway. And uh, my car was starting to, I, I was going at about 80 miles an hour. And my car, by the way, in perfectly clear weather uh, and also um, large vision in terms of how far down the road I could see, and nobody else was on the road. So this was perfectly safe. And at about 80 miles an hour, the car started to shake. 
So I thought, okay, what should I do? Well, if it was a resonant frequency, this is my test of it being a resonant frequency. See, if it was a resonant frequency, yes, the shaking would go away if I slowed down, but the shaking would go away also if I sped up to 90 degrees, to 90 miles an hour. And so I tested that. And yes, it was a resonant frequency. There was no shaking at 90. There was no shaking at 70. Um, now, that was the initial theory for why this bridge collapsed. But now that didn't hold water because, you see, th these guys who build these bridges are sophisticated engineers. They understand that you have these interactions between the bridge and the air flows. And they actually test for stability of the bridge. How do they test for the stability of the bridge? You see, now with the bridge, you have nonlinear partial differential equations re related to the stresses of the components. Then you have the fluid equations of winds, which is the Navier-Stokes equations. And then you've got the interactions of these two very different systems of partial differential equations. How, now, this is 1940. How do you check to see if this system is stable? Well, what the, the practice was the following. You first compute all the stresses if there's no wind and if there's no movement in the bridge. So you look at sort of a stationary state, steady state, where there's no movement. And then if you want to know what happens with the bridge when it's disturbed by some wind, you then linearize around that stationary state. And you do the linearization, and then you say it's a linearization. So then you, you look, then you basically get a Jacobian, and you look to see what the eigenvalues are of that Jacobian. And if all the eigenvalues are stable, then you know you have a stable bridge. That's a check that they did. Now, by the way, resonant frequencies would be caught in that test. If you had a simple resonant frequency, you would catch it in that linearization test. Um, but this still collapsed. What happened? Well, uh, they brought, um, after this collapse, they were puzzled. They brought in one of the world's most renowned um, experts in uh, fluids. Um, I forget the name, but it was Austrian. This is 1940. So eh, we got a lot of really smart people uh, moving to the United States in the late 30s. So, uh, so anyway, so this physicist then, it basically argued that no, the problem was that there was a nonlinear uh, oscillation set up and that linearization missed it, that you had to go to more global kinds of solution methods to understand the dynamic stability of the bridge. Now, have bridges fallen down because of this problem in the, in the past uh, 80 years? No, because engineers learn from disasters. I wish I could say that of economists. Uh, because the primary method for looking at complex dynamic systems in macroeconomics is to do exactly what those bridge engineers did um, 80 years ago. You first look at the system when there's no disturbances and everything settled down into a steady state. And then you <clears throat> take that deterministic system, you linearize it. And then you take that linear approximation and use it globally to analyze your nonlinear system. Now, uh, you might think, well, that's a cute story and all that. But of course, we know that this log linearization business, what do you want to call it? Log linearization, linearization, <clears throat> it, that it didn't have a great success in the past decades. Because of course, we had all this innovation in financial markets in the late 90s and changes in regulations. And then the system blew up in 2008. Now, there's a further analogy here. 
Why did the engineers screw up so badly on this bridge? Well, because they had made innovations in engineering design that lightened the bridge, but also altered the flow of air. So their engineering innovations led them to a bad design, but the bad design was not detected by their usual test of stability of linearized systems. Now, does that sound familiar? Anyway. So this is uh, just, uh, and by the way, I said engineers do learn one catastrophe at a time. Uh, the punchline here is how many catastrophes will it take for macroeconomists to learn? And by the way, they're demonstrating their um, incompetence even now with the COVID crisis. Um, so what uh, I, along with Young Yang Kai and Yev Steinbucks, did is develop a method called nonlinear certainty equivalent. Now, basically, it boils down to just solving a deterministic problem. But the advantage of it is that it uses basic numerical tools and massive parallelism together, which allows us then to solve enormous problems. Okay, so that's uh, everything I'm going to be talking about today is trivial. The individual, the individual steps could have been done 30 years ago. But this would have been a very inefficient way to proceed 30 years ago. Now, with massive parallelism, this procedure can solve high dimensional problems in macro and economics. Okay, so uh, back to sharing. Um, by the way, I did send around the. Uh, um, uh, the slides. So um, um, in an email about 10 minutes ago. So let me um, get my screen arranged. And by the way, as always, uh, feel free to use the chat um, feature of Zoom to uh, um, ask any questions. Now, the first slide, uh, it, it, well, this is, yeah, NLCEQ 2020. Okay, so this is a PDF of a mathematical notebook. Now, uh, let me, there, anyway. Um, oh, okay, one more thing. There, now, um, here's the basic idea. Now, you've all seen these very simple macro growth models where you have a utility function, you have C, a gross output function, F of K. Now, gross output means that, um, that tomorrow's capital stock is gross output minus consumption. Okay, so that's, um, I often like to refer to this as the corn economy because you have some capital stock of corn and then you plant the corn and in the spring and in the fall, you have F of K amount of corn um, uh, in your hands. And then you, know, you, you may eat some of that corn, but the rest of it is then corn seeds that are used for planting next year. Uh, so you have the Bellman equation, first order conditions, um, you, you solve you use the envelope theorem. And anyway, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this particular case uh, where I have a closed form solution, log utility, Cobb Douglas production. Um, and so we have here's the true value function, and here's the true consumption function. Okay, so this is a case where we have an exact solution to the consumption function. And I'm going to then uh, show you. Um, use this example to talk about various approximations. Now, um, so, okay, so basically um, a lot of this is just stuff we're not going to use, but go down here. Lin is the linearization of the consumption function 
around the steady state. I always set steady states equal to be equal to one. I, I, I succeeded in doing that by choosing um, various parameters carefully. Uh, so steady state is one, and then uh, the linear approximation is just a Taylor, linear Taylor series approximation around uh, capital stock equal to steady state. And here's a quadratic approximation, and here's the cubic, and then there's more down here, but they aren't important. Now, how good is the linear approximation? Well, this is savings. What I'm going to do here is plot the savings function. So this is um, what the net increase in capital stock is, net savings. So um, if so, tomorrow's capital stock is f of k minus k, and then I subtract out what the true solution would say, and you see the error. So uh, by the oh, uh, anyway, which ones? Anyway, you see there's a difference. Uh, I should have labeled that. Which one's true? Let me see, I can figure this out. The next, yeah, that's, okay. So the blue seems to be true. Yeah, the blue is true. And you see that uh, the orange line is uh, the linear approximation. Now, as you go from linear approximation to quadratic approximation, you notice that the approximation is getting better. And then here's the cubic getting better close to the steady state. So it's a local approximation. However, uh, things aren't really, like out here at 2 or 2.5, things aren't really getting better. In fact, they ultimately are going to get worse. And here's in here we see it yeah, getting bad at, at the degree 4 approximation. So um, but my focus today is going to be on um, the fact that the linear uh, linearizations uh, will do okay near the steady state, but uh, if something kicks your economy away from the steady state by a significant amount, then uh, it's not a good approximation. Now, here's um, next period's capital stock as a function of today. And so uh, uh, this, we know the true uh the true capital stock yeah 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 this linear line is a true mapping from today's capital stock to tomorrow's and we see the linear approximation really misses the target here um when you go non-trivially above the steady state um and then here it's um uh here's yeah okay here's another plot of the errors um, I, but anyway, basically what happens is that the, um, you know, linear approximations don't do so well. Now, I am going to show you the basic idea for NLCEQ, nonlinear certainty equivalent, using this very trivial example. But I want to, I do it in this way so that you see what are the key elements? Now, first of all, I take a list of the states. I, I just enumerate some states between um, 0 0.1 and 3 uh, with step size 0.1. That's what this does. So I'm going to take those capital stocks, 30 capital stocks. Now then, at each of these capital stocks, I'm going to compute the consumption. Now, since I know what the consumption function is, I can just directly compute these. But typically, we don't have a closed form solution. So typically, we would use these for, each, for the initial, we would solve the optimal control problem given these initial states. And we will solve this numerically. So typically, we would say, oh, Let's say the capital stock is 0.5 today, and then we solve this dynamic optimization problem like we've done before, you know, like, um, like in your uh, homework assignment for life cycle problems. And then we would have the numerical procedure would then give you uh, this number, 2.699. So normally this is a numerical step, but just for purposes here, I'm just giving you this case. Now, notice this is where modern hardware comes into play. 
you can parallelize the computation of these consumptions at various capital stocks. So I could list a thousand capital stocks here. And if I had a hundred cores, I could give each core 10 of these capital stocks and tell them, tell each core, well, you solve the problem for those 10. And then I'll collect um, that to get the whole list of consumptions. This is a state, this is a stage at which massive parallelism is exploited massively by this procedure. Um, <clears throat> and so this is, so this is, um, and we'll see examples. When I say massive, I don't mean just using the two pathetic cores on your laptop, or if you're rich, you might have four cores on your laptop. Um, if you're filthy rich, you might have eight. But anyway, uh, we're, that's, that's pitiful parallelization. Um, we're talking massive parallelization um, in the examples. So you can compute all these. And then once you have all these, basically data points, then what you realize is that you know the consumption function. So you know the consumption fun, you know what consumption is at 0 0.1, at 0 0.2, et cetera. You have all this data now. Then what you want to do, suppose you want to get a degree seven polynomial approximation. Uh, you just then do um, this in Mathematica. This is just the uh, linear regression uh, problem. You fit, you um, take the data and then you tell it to give me a degree seven polynomial that fits it. Here it is. That doesn't tell you anything. But now we plot the um, difference between this degree seven polynomial and the truth. And what you see is a beautiful picture. <clears throat> Basically, notice that the error uh, has how many turning points? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's a degree seven polynomial as seven turning points. It means you have about as the best possible polynomial for that data. Also, the thing is that the, the magnitude of the error is practically um, it is all practically uniform across here. So bingo, we have a nice approximation. Now that is what we're going to do. Except in the problems that we're going to talk about. It, they're they're going to be problems with, um, they're going to be problems with multiple capital stocks, a vector of capital stocks, or um, um, also utility functions. Going to be uh, our favorite example is one where you have multiple countries. Each country has a capital stock. Each country has its own consumption, and so then you end up having. Um, it's um, also adjustment costs are, are non-trivial for a capital stock. So if you have 100 countries, then you have 100 different capital stocks and that's your capital stock state is, uh, is 100 dimensional. Then on top of that, suppose you have productivity shocks. So that output is not, F of, is not A times K to the alpha, but it's multiplied by some shock theta. Well, then each country has its own productivity shock. So that's another 100 dimensions. Um, so you basically have a 200 dimensional state space. This is no problem for an LCEQ because then you list the, um, by the way, you don't have closed form solutions, of course. Then you list your states, but now instead of being 30 points in one dimension, you do tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of points in what, however many dimensions you have, a couple hundred or whatever. And, but then again, you take massive parallelism. You solve each of, given some, get, give, given some specification for a state, initial state, you can then solve the dynamic problem and find out what the vector of consumptions are and all the labor supply, et cetera, at each of those states. That can be done in parallel. And then you get this nice data business and then you do multivariate regression to get these uh, like a consumption function. That is the basic idea. Um, 
And now you might say, well, gee, uh, uh, that's good for optimization problems, but what if you don't, what if you have problems where the solution is not an optimum? What if you have a, a tax distorted economy? Or what if you have a new Keynesian model, which is not the solution to some uh, social planners problem? Well, no big deal, because then all you're doing is then solving a system of equations, and that can be done, as we've seen, by using um, op nonlinear optimization solvers. So one of our examples is going to be new Keynesian model, a simple one, um, uh, but you'll see how we can do it. Now, first, let's go through more of the formal presentation. Now, okay, let me emphasize again, okay, what you've been, okay, those of you who suffered through a macro course, um, you've seen log linearization. By the way, log linearization, linearization, same thing. It's just the log linearization is where you've done a nonlinear change of variables and then um, uh, you do the linearization in log of K or something. Now, <clears throat> What that method does is only it only does the approximation around the steady state of the deterministic problem. It shuts down all the noise. You compute the deterministic steady state, and then you create a linear approximation for decision rules, etc., around the deterministic steady state. And then you use that rule that linear rule that you derive from a deterministic model, you then use to analyze and simulate a stochastic problem. So that is what we call a certainty equivalent approach. You approximate a stochastic problem by, some, by a certainty one, and then you hope that they're close enough so it's a certainty equivalent. Now, by the way, if you have uh, quadratic dynamic programming that leads then to the standard Riccati equation, then from those problems you know that the variance doesn't affect the decision rules. And so you really do have a certain equivalent. All I'm trying to emphasize to you is that what the, this log linearization method typically does, yes, there's some discussions of higher order stuff, we'll talk about that later, but by and large, from what I see, it's based log linearization is exactly as I described it. You shut down all the noise, you then come up with a linear approximation um, around the steady state, and then you use that linear approximation of the deterministic model, use it then in your stochastic model. Okay, now, so our first example is going to be um, infinite horizon, dyne, or okay infinite or finite horizon deterministic dynamic programming. And you've seen this either from me or some other context where basically you have some state variable and X is your state, A is your vector of actions. The state tomorrow is a function of the current state um, and actions. And you, uh, you maximize the discounted sum of utilities plus some discounted terminal value. So, so what we want to do is compute the value function and also the decision rule function over some domain. Um, uh, what the, okay. Um, yeah, by the way, these slides are courtesy of Young Yang, and so I don't know what this, this stability problem means anyway. I'll have to edit some of this. Now, the new method uh, is um, a nonlinear certain equivalent model for dynamic stochastic models. Uh, but now, um, what, what we're going to do is start with a deterministic one. And what we're going to do is compute basically the deterministic, the value function and decision rule function, the policy function for the deterministic problem. So here's the, now by the way, my example in that Mathematica notebook had a uniform set of points. <clears throat> and it, when you go to higher dimensions, you don't wanna just take 
the Cartesian grid of all that, that's cursed dimensionality travel. So, so basically you have to, you specify your domain and then you find some intelligent way to approximate uh, the function on that domain. And you, now there's Smolyak polynomials that you could use with the Smolyak nodes. There's complete polynomials and those nodes can be taken from monomial rules for quadrature. <coughs> Sorry. There's sparse grids, epsilon distinguishable sets. These are things that we, we're, I'll talk about in detail later when I talk about expand my approximation lectures. But basically the point here is that you choose some approximation method, maybe it's just least squares or least squares to cubic power, whatever. And then you, then you um, choose some, some appropriate corresponding set of approximation nodes. Now then you do your data collection step. So for each point in this set of nodes, you solve the large scale optimal control problem to find the value if you start at that X point and the action at that X point. Now, you see what, okay. What I'm really doing here, you say I, I'm, some of my comments may be confusing because sometimes it sounds like I'm talking about dynamic programming, but then I'm also talking about optimal control. Well, the thing is that for deterministic problems, dynamic programming in the Bellman equation is just another way to describe optimal control problems. Optimal control problems just solves off for the sequence of actions and states. Um, dynamic programming problems focus on value functions. Uh, but they're the same thing. They're, so this is, in some sense, my introduction to you to create approximating a value function. What you do is you just solve the optimal control problems and then gather up the data and then do some regression and you get a value function. So for deterministic problems, optimal control is adequate and also it, well, it's quite applicable and then by solving the optimal control problem at many, many, many initial states, you can actually get data for the value function. Now, here's where massive parallelism comes into play. Uh, you can, if you have a million nodes and you have a thousand cores, then what you do is you send um, each you could send each core a thousand of those nodes and then you wait a while and then they all come back and report to the master um, node uh, what the results are. Now a smarter way to go because there's variation in how long these problems will take to compute is what you do, let's say you have a million points and a thousand nodes, a thousand cores, then what you might want to do is break up the million nodes into packets of a hundred and then you send out these packets to um, the various nodes. And now you can't, you, you've, you do one sweep of the nodes, you only have done 100,000 points. But that what happens is that some node is going to get done first, and then you send it a new packet of 100. Some other, no, some other compute nodes might take a while. So basically, you juggle things around. You wait, this is called bal balancing issues. So um, <clears throat> you can basically count on for a problem like this that um, you, you can keep all the cores busy 99% of the time. So you get perfect speed up. Now there's other kinds of economies of scale. These problems have a sparsity structure that you can use. Now, the thing is that it's the same sparsity structure, you know, the, the, what, um, the, the Jacobian of the constraints, um, um, for example, or the um, Hessian matrix of the objective um, as a certain sparsity structure. Um, but all you have to do is determine it once because as you change the Xi naught, you're not gonna change the sparsity structure. You spend time, to determine exactly what the sparsity structure is, 
And then that tells you something about the efficient algorithms to use. And then you use that. That's a, the, determining the sparsity is a fixed cost. And you can spread that fixed cost out over all of the problems. <clears throat> now, the same thing is true for differentiation. Um, you may want to use derivatives in your, um, in your problem. Well, and, and typically you may be lazy and just use finite differences. Um, but now here, what you can do is spend time, your time or the computer's time in particular, if you have Cassati, something you heard lectures about, then you can have the computer do this. But again, it's one time cost to come up with efficient code for the derivatives and you use that repeatedly. The other kind of economies of scale is that you can collect the nodes, these X's, into various clusters that where each point is close to each other. And so then when you solve one, the solution at one point, then you the next problem you do is you solve it for some other nearby state <clears throat> where the solution is going to be probably similar. And so the initial guess from the second problem will be the solution from the first. Furthermore, that's called the warm strut. Furthermore, whatever your Hessian approximation was when you ended the first, you can use that as the initial Hessian for the second. That's called the hot start. And so by having this sequence, by doing things in a sequence of nodes, each close to the next one, uh, you can achieve very large speed ups because um, you will, each problem will start with a good initial guess and also a good initial approximation for the Hessians and Jacobians, and it goes much faster. <clears throat> so not only is this, not only is this problem going to be able to use massive parallelism, so that if you have a thousand nodes um, and a thousand points, it's going to be, or, let's say, if you have a thousand, yeah, a thousand million no million points and a thousand nodes, it's going to be a thousand. It's going to be more than a thousand times faster than using a serial machine. Or a million, anyway. Um, it's going to be faster also because you can organize the computation in such a way that the marginal cost of solving a state x i naught is going to be very small. So that you're going to, but the mass of parallelism, see, this is also what's common here is that mass of parallelism allows you to solve enormous problems. And when you have an enormous problem, you can often organize the calculations so that you can make, take advantage of warm and hot starts and other kinds of uh, um, things to economize the total calculation. So parallelism, not only makes it go faster because of just raw speed, but it also gives you the opportunity to think about things and um, make it go even faster by using intelligent optimization methods. Now you gather that data and then um, you gather that data, this is for the value function and the, um, <clears throat> and the action, and then you do, some kind of curve fitting um, procedure to get um, your, S, your approximation of the value function. And this notation says it's V hat, so it's an approximate value function over the X's, but then the B, V is a vector, is a, um, a vector of coefficients, or actually it's a tensor of coefficients that are gonna be used in your approximation scheme. Similarly, the policy function is also going to be um, computed by some curve fitting. Now by curve fitting, I could mean ordinary least squares. Um, however, I will surely not ever mean ordinary least squares. Um, now what we'll talk about this later when I talk about my, in my, in my approximation two lecture, I'll be talking about Tikhonov regularization, talking about L1 lasso uh, method. So there are many ways of fitting a curve through a cloud of points. Um, least, ordinary least squares regression is about the only one that can mess up. Um, but anyway, so that's, um, again, um, 
the details of this will be, I'll give you some more efficient ways. You can think about just simple um, regression here to get this, but we can do better. Now, the, now there's natural parallelism everywhere. There's natural parallelism here over the large number of points. There's even parallelism here at this stage. Because often what happens is that your state, vec your state vector will have some continuous variables, such as capital stock, but they may have some discrete states. Um, for example, it's often useful to discretize the productivity states and just have these productivity states follow some finite markup chain. Well, then what happens is that this value function in the productivity dimension is really just a list of value functions, one value function for each productivity level. And so then you really have lots of smaller regression problems to do, and they can also be done in, in parallel, because once you have the data for um, everything you need for some, <clears throat> some productivity level theta bar, well, then you've got the data, then send off to some core the problem of doing the regression for that. And so there's parallelism even in the fitting step if you have some discrete state variables. Now, um, so in the, uh, so let's go, that's, that's the basic NLCEQ method for, um, op, for dynamic optimization problems. Now we're gonna look at infinite horizon, infinite horizon deterministic dynamic programming is this. Um, now, typically what happens when you have infinite horizon, you do something to transform it into a finite horizon problem. Um, basically, that means you pin down the problem at some time, some point in the distant future where you don't care much about what happens there. Um, so then um, here's the simplest example. Um, and then what we do is we... Um, we, okay, so, okay. And then by the way, this uh, dot GMS, I, I, will, I will post the, these are GAMS, GAMS files that were used to compute all these things. Um, now then, now remember, so what we're really trying to solve here is a stochastic problem. And that's the case with macro log linearization, stochastic problems. And that's what we're gonna try to do but we're going to now um, use um, uh, the NLCEQ method. Now, by the way, I list here some of the advantages um, over other methods. Um, I beat up on, well, I haven't done enough beating up on perturbation, but I'm gonna run out of time. So that's enough beating up on them. Also um, projection methods and value function iteration uh, have issues. So um, uh, we're gonna proceed. Uh, with this example. Now, uh, here's an N country optimal growth problem, N countries. And so it's your usual, um, each country has a utility function, has its own capital stock. Um, each country's log productivity follows some uh, standard um, shock process. So there's a common component to productivity and then there's an idiosyncratic component to productivity. And then uh, there's, um, uh, basically, we allow we do allow for trade here. So basically, the total amount of consumption and investment expenditures, um, net of depreciation, has to equal total output minus adjustment costs. Where here's the usual production function, adjustment costs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> now, so what we can do is we can use the NLCEQ method to solve a large number of optimal control problems to then get a kind of, to get an approximate value function and decision rules. But now you might ask, how good is it for the stochastic problem? And so what we do is we, we take the decision, we take the decision rules that we have, and then we, we then plug them into um, error equations for the stochastic problem. 
So here we take the decision rules for consumption, labor supply, et cetera, um, for the stochastic problem, for the, take the decision rules for the deterministic problem and then compute this. This is a marginal rate of substitution basically. Um, and uh, then plug it into the expectation um, operator for the stochastic problem and then see how, how good we have come to solving the stochastic problem. <clears throat> and now um, what we see here is that uh, two countries, we use degree and complete Chebyshev polynomials. And what we see here is that uh, for degree two, we get um, two, two degree accuracy. Chebyshev is um, three, three, three digit accuracy. Um, and then um, small yak, we also, which use a small, okay, level one, level two. And anyways, that'll, if you don't know what that means, it just means it's a more sophisticated kind of um, approximation scheme also does very well up to three digits or even, and could even go further. Now, this is for higher dimensions. Now, what we do is, let's say you have 50 countries. 50 countries, by the way, means 50 capital stocks and 50 productivities. Um, and let's say we just want a, um, uh, I think this, yeah, just a quadratic or just a linear rule um, approximation. And we have 201 points um, and we, the terminal time is at 20 and we get, we get very good Euler equation errors. Um, now if we do a level L small yak point, this is level L small yak. And we have, then we have 20,000 points. And then we allocate it across 2,048 um, cores. And we have cap T equals uh, uh, 20. And then we get, um, we get better errors, but the error is about half the size here. And the error here is almost, okay, by the way, the max, the max, this is like an L infinity error. This is like the maximum of every place. This is more global as the average. So we get average three digit accuracy. And what is interesting here is that the, by taking 2000 cores and 2000 2, cores, 20,000 points and time 20 takes 8.3 minutes, but 20,000 cores um, time 50, uh, we get higher accuracy by an order of magnitude here. Um, that takes about the same amount of time. Um, um, one reason is because there's not as much uh, economies of scale because this has one point per core. And so a lot of time is eaten up by communication. Um, and then now we, we did a um, 100 countries, 200 dimensions, 200 countries, 400 dimensions, and we get a very good um, accuracy and all this in eight minutes. By the way, this, um, by the way, we don't have 20,000 cores on our laptops or our desktops. This was done um, using the Blue Water supercomputer, which is based in um, University of Illinois, uh, Champaign-Urbana. It was the NSF supercomputer, lead supercomputer for many years. It has now been retired. Um, these supercomputers have life expectancies of like seven or eight years. It, however, has been, that computer has been taken over by a project based here in, in the Bay Area. Um, and I think it's called um, C3.ai. Um, but anyway, so it's, the computer's still there, but we don't have access to it. Um, now, okay, you can say, okay, this is, uh, <clears throat> this is nice. <coughs> this is cute, but can we solve that, that? Can we solve hard problems? For example, suppose we have a real business cycle model, but now we have 
a constraint on investment. So you have a constraint, you, that investment, gross investment in each, gross investment in each period has to be above some minimal positive amount. Um, and so, and occasionally these will, these constraints, this constraint will be binding. Occasionally in some states of the world, you'll want to have less investment than that, but you can't. So now what we did, it's, a, it's the same problem. You know, it's the same problem, just as the same as we had before, um, except now we're um, doing um, the, um, now we're, we're adding in this constraint of uh, that investment in each period of time has to be above some some minimum amount. So, um, and then there's all sorts of papers written on uh, how difficult this is, uh, methods for um, problems with occasionally bounding constraints, et cetera. Well, now what we're going to do is we're going to, um, <clears throat> we're going to use this method for this. Because you see the optimal control, imposing that constraint on the optimal control problem, on the deterministic problem over time, imposing that constraint is easy. It's trivial. You just put down the constraint and you have, um, you have the solution. Now here, so then basically this is, um, okay, so the solid lines are the degree one, um, the errors, the, the errors for the solutions of degree one perturbation. And this is for different um, productivity levels, I guess, of productivity factors. Now, what you should do is compare the blue line to the blue stars, the red line to the red stars, and the black line to the black pluses. Now, what you see is that for A equals 0 0.7, the blue line, which corresponds to the errors as a function of the um, capital stock, um, the blue, uh, with, with A equals that parameter, what was A again? A is this, um, this um, parameter here in product output, in productivity. So in that case, linearizing around the deterministic steady state does a bad job. Um, and so here you're um, basically the, you, basically this sense log of the error is almost zero. That means basically you have no reliable digits. Whereas down here, um, the three stars, you have four accurate digits. And actually notice that the NLCEQ is always roughly four digit accurate. The only time when um, uh, the, log, the log linearization does as well as the NLCEQ is when you have the productivity set at the, determined, the steady state productivity of one. See, basically this productivity process is bouncing around. Um, and so it's, it's stochastic. And so sometimes uh, the, in the law, the, if you didn't have this um, noise here, then the log productivity process would go to zero. And then that means productivity is one. So, but remember in the log linearization stuff, what you do is you turn off all the noise. You look at the steady state. That implies a steady state capital stock that implies a steady state productivity level. And you, you log linearize around that. And you end up, and by the way, I, my impression is that people just log linearize holding the theta fixed anyway. Um, so this is what you get. Um, and by the way, the thing is that I should, this should be stretched out to be like between 0.5 and 1.5 because then um, the, the log linearization results are going to get worse out here, but the NLCEQ is going to be fine. So what you see here is that log linearization, because it typically ignores the shocks to productivity, um, is not going to be well. And even if you're at the steady state productivity level, you see that, yes, 
NLCEQ does about the same as log linearization. If you're close to the steady state, but when you get away from the steady state, NLCEQ is going to give you a very good approximation, whereas the uh, linearizations cannot. And now here's a, we plot out the investment policy with um, some, uh, some plots of what the, uh, um, what the, how much investment you do. Um, and uh, this is, um, uh, yeah, so this yeah, investment as a function of your technological parameter. So basically when A, the technological parameter is small, you don't wanna do any investing. Um, but when it's high, you do want to invest. Um, and so you know, these plots show that. By the way, the paper describes um, these models in uh, better detail, more greater detail. So let me at this point take my 60 minute pause. Um, if you have any questions, comments, please ask them now because um, you've seen the basic idea, you've seen an application to the basic uh, real business cycle multi-country model, and now you've also seen where we can do, um, <clears throat> by the way, I should say that when we do the <clears throat> problem with the constraint on investment, we then can't do just simple regression, ordinary regressions on polynomials, one has to come up with functional forms that are flexible enough to do, uh, to handle kinks in decision rules. Um, but there's a variety of methods like that that will do that. Um, okay. So um, the, uh, the hazards of doing things at home. Um, so then you have to come up with some appropriate um, a functional form that can handle that kink. And we didn't have any problem to do that, and so you should look at um, the result now. So what are the advantages compared to perfect foresight? This is perfect foresight. See, basically, the, um, this problem here, the individual deterministic problem, is a perfect foresight problem. The deterministic problem is perfect foresight. And by the way, when you look at what log linearization does, it linearizes a perfect foresight problem, okay? So what NLCEQ does is look at a large variety of deterministic perfect foresight models. That's what NLCEQ do, does. And so yeah, th this, like this problem here is a perfect foresight problem. Um, and now maybe I haven't expressly written it in the fashion that it looks like it. The next example will be one where the perfect foresight nature is transparent. Um, um, so, um, but this is, this is perfect foresight. I, I suspect that what you were thinking, what you're maybe you're used to seeing perfect foresight models um, written as a sequence of Euler equations. Um, but I, I could write this as a sequence of Euler equations, but I didn't here. Um, but this is a perfect foresight, the deterministic problem is a perfect foresight one. Does that answer the question? Um, Or did you mean by something else by perfect foresight? Good, okay. Yeah. Um, any other questions, comments? And that's a very good question because I can see why um, it didn't look like perfect foresight because um, uh, um, it was written as a dynamic optimization problem. Can be done instead. Oh, okay. The question, as everybody see, can, can you do state-dependent log linearization? Um, 
state dependent log linearization is an, is an incoherent um, concept. Um, log linearization, when, it, when you're talking about linearizing dynamical systems, that always is done, let's say, in mathematics. If you're talking about computing the linear approximation of a dynamic system, you are talking about linearizing around a stationary point. There are macro papers that talk about things like linearizing around other points that aren't the steady state. Um, they, uh, some of them are mathematically incoherent. Um, when I look at the details of others, it looks like it's something other than log linearization. So um, uh, the, the, in mathematics, there's no such thing as log linearizing around something that's not a stationary point. Um, and then I think later on in the course, um, I will be talking about uh, projection methods and log linearization and comparisons and then um, I think then you'll get a more complete answer to that question other than just saying log linearization being state dependent, dependent is incoherent. So um, any other questions? Okay, now, now suppose you have discrete stochastic states. And suppose that you, you have, a, have, let's say, productivity, let's say thinking productivity shocks as being limited to a finite number of thetas. Now, how can you transform that into one of these deterministic problems? Because now in the deterministic problem, when we do the, um, okay. Well, anyway. In the deterministic problem, you're, the transition from state, okay, like, okay, back up here. Um, now this tech, here, the productivity state here is a continuous number A. And so, right, so basically in this case, um, the, the, that's another continuous dimension. And it, the log of it, um, the log of A moves in a simple AR1 process. Now suppose that we have a problem where the A is restricted to being a finite state and its transition rules are governed by a Markov chain. And that's not going to have this simple form where tomorrow's um, uh, productivity is a simple function of today's plus some noise. Now, how are you going to deal with that? Because you see, the thing is that when, when you start with some initial, see in this, the, the deterministic version of this is to start with some initial K and some initial A, and then um, basically the A progresses by in this simple fashion, um, deterministically. Um, but now, how, what's the deterministic analog for um, when you have finite states? Well, what we do is that at when we, if we're, if we're going to start with a particular initial state and that initial state involves the capital stock and um, some productivity levels, but the productivity levels evolve in a discrete finite markup chain fashion. What we do is that in the deterministic problem, we replace theta at time t by basically the expected value of theta conditional on what it is at time zero. And so that's what this um, expression really is, is that we do revert to, uh, back up here, this theta, well, in this case, it's A. A of T will be replaced by this deterministic trend of the averages of um, the ones that uh, proceed. So, so um, that's how you can apply this even when, when you have determined a uh, finite number of thetas. 
And so this took a little while to think about. And also, um, when we first did this, I was a little skeptical about whether or not it would work. Actually, it does very well. So basically, you again, um, now, by the way, I don't know how log linearization, this is an example of, I don't know how you do log linearization other than just um, holding theta fixed at the steady state value in a situation like this. Um, but um, 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 so this is the way we, we did it, is that again, we pin down the initial, theta, the initial states and then if a state is exogenous and evolves according to a Markov process, we replace the stochastic path with its expectation. And um, in the paper, there's some discussion of um, the, um, how good that is and how well it does and all that. Now comes competitive equilibrium. Now this is, this now looks like um, well, if there's no, if there's no expectations here, this is what a perfect foresight model looks like. Um, you have state today, actions today, and then state tomorrow, actions tomorrow, and they have to <coughs> satisfy some first order conditions, market clearing, um, whatever. So basically, um, this is where you, um, have basically a list of equations and it's an infinitely long list, t equals zero, one, two, et cetera. And you assume that there's a convergent steady state. Now, how can you compute this equilibrium? Now, this starts out as an infinite set of equations. We got to make it finite somehow. So we're gonna cut it off at some finite time t. And then, um, we're going to um, basically stop it at some, we're, we're gonna solve it out only for the horizon up to capital T, up to, well, equations up to T minus one, cap T minus one. And then there's still gonna be variables at time T that have to be um, chosen in order to satisfy this equation. So what we do is we minimize, basically what you say is that I'm gonna choose a path of X's and A's such that at time capital T, I am as close as I can be to the steady state. That's how you, this is one way of making an infinite horizon problem finite horizon. You just write down the equations, perfect foresight equations, as constraints, and then you just say, ah, I just want to get it. I want my terminal time to be as close as possible to the long run steady state. So this is an optimization problem. Um, now it is, um, oh, it's, it solves competitive equilibrium. I've changed competitive equilibrium problems, which normally regarded as being equations, um, but into a, um, uh, optimization problem. Now, what's our application going to be? And here now is uh, the macro example. New Keynesian model, where you have sticky prices and all sorts of stuff. Um, if you don't know what a New Keynesian model is, you're not going to learn it from these slides. Um, new Keynesian models are ones where prices are sticky, um, and also, in the, and the interest rate is controlled by the, um, by the Federal Reserve or some government actor. And then um, what happens is that there's shocks to the system. In this case, the shocks are gonna be uh, to the uh, discount uh, factor. Um, by the way, in this model, um, uh, Basically, there's, there's no capital in this model, in this, this particular example, and capital is missing in, in sort of the basic New Keynesian models. And then all the profits are given to the government, and then the government gives them back to the people, whatever. Um, so you have that is a representative household. 
Uh, the discount factor evolves in accordance with some AR1 process, uh, simple utility function. Uh, then what happens is you have a continuum of goods that are then aggregated to create a final good. Um, so this is basically, if, if you're old like me, you'll recognize this being like the Dixit Stiglitz specification of, of goods. And then there's a final good that then enters into the utility function. And of course, what happens here is that um, at every time, only a small, only a fraction, one minus theta of the firms are allowed to change their prices. And the other, the remaining fraction have to keep the same price next period as they do this period. And so basically each firm, if it's given a chance to change its price, will choose its price to maximize its expected um, profits. Um, and, and so that's the story here. By the way, there is in the background, there's this funny assumption I don't like that um, all risks are shared. Um, so like if a firm get, has bad luck, it's never asked to change its price. So then its profitability is gonna drop. And um, anyway, there's some, in the background, there's some sharing transfers to um, avoid that. <clears throat> and so then you get these, um, so you have these specifications. Here's def price is defined to be this and labor supply is of course just the sum of the labors. Now, by the way, I think the, this is also a model where each individual has his own firm and he, his labor supply is spent given to that firm for production. And then there's some government stuff and then there's an Euler equation. Um, and then the key thing, zero lower bound, is that the interest rate that the government chooses the interest rate, but um, it has to be um, bigger than or equal to zero. And basically Z is the, uh, if it didn't have a constraint, this would be the optimal uh, choice for interest rate at every point in time. However, the government can't send interest rates negative. Um, so then the true interest rate is going to be um, the max of zero and the desired interest rate. Now, by the way, this interest rate is the nominal interest rate, not the real interest rate. Negative real interest rates are, well, I remember in the 70s, we always had negative real interest rates um, because of high inflation. Um, so this is the nominal interest rate is um, bounded below by zero. Now, of course, for those of you living in Germany, and Switzerland, well, you know that no, even nominal interest rates can go negative. So there's, there's some lower bound. If you go too negative, then the whole, then you get really big headaches. Um, but having it go slightly negative um, is, has been done by um, some uh, monetary authorities in Europe. Uh, and um, I think I've read where Trump is a fan of that. Um, he's also a fan of using uh, malaria medicine to treat COVID. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so, but for, for the purposes of these papers, we just um, assume that there's a zero lower bound. Now, so that, may, that creates a kink in all of this. And you have, you have a bunch of other Euler equations now then you have consumption that has decisions that have been decided. Um, and then there's all this and labor supply and, uh, and R is decided um, and Z is this anyway. So there's all these things that have to be decided. The state variables are beta, the discount factor, and then this um, uh, L over you know, L over Y variable. Um, and so we got lots of policy functions, only two, dimen two dimensions in terms of the state. And again, what we find is that uh, um, the, okay, so here's the scheme is a solid line is, um, yeah, 
order one perturbation solid circles is NLCEQ. And again, um, notice that over this range, NLCQ is at least as good, if not much better than the um, perturbation, math log linearization. And then here, okay, then um, Young Yang got excited about doing macroeconomics, so he put in an impulse response function in the paper. Um, so, um, so the, um, so this is the case where this, um, yeah, for when this is, I think the most, um, interesting approach. And also basically this, this is what most of macro, I mean, today, the new Keynesian models do not come out, the, their equilibrium are not solutions to social planet problems. Um, so we can't use dynamic programming for that. Uh, however, um, that doesn't, but that mean, but but everything we've done with dynamic programming, we can do here also in order to um, solve out for the deterministic versions of these uh, problems. Uh, for, yeah, for, for competitive equilibrium where you don't have a social planner problem. The key thing is finding some method to, to tie the problem off at a finite horizon. And this is the one that I like the most. Um, some people will say, well, let's pin down the terminal actions at the steady state or pin down the terminal states. That's, but the problem is that sometimes you may, <laughs> the, the number of degrees of freedom may be different than the number of variables you're thinking of. And so just putting in this um, basically Euclidean norm, by the way, I suspect there should be a square here. Um, this, this should be the L2 norm, not to make it a smooth problem. Um, so, um, the, uh, uh, this is a nice way to tie it, bring the infinite horizon down to some finite, um, horizon problem that, of course, that does a good approximation of the infinite horizon problem. Um, and then with this in place, um, one can do, you know, millions of these individual problems and find out what the decision rules are, the equilibrium pricing rules are, et cetera, um, for these um, macro problems. So um, now I, I knew this, that it wouldn't have time to fit the, um, there's a fit in the more general case. <clears throat> I've assumed here that the problem is time homogeneous that the um that the there that nothing depends on calendar time um and so that it's time homo time homogeneous now there are many problems for which things do change over time and not in some stationary fashion for those of you familiar with uh, climate change uh, literature, that is a fundamentally non-stationary problem because over the course of uh, the next uh, several hundred years, uh, we're gonna have a monotonic increasing the um, concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere and uh, various things, um, various transitions. Also population is um, trending up, productivity, et cetera. So, and there's no simple uh, transformation of variables detrending to make it a stationary problem. Now I might ask, how does this apply for those problems? Well, if you're talking about what the decision rules are today in the value function today, then um, your optimization problems are gonna be ones that are themselves not stationary and so then you can solve it um, out in the same way. Now, you may be interested in knowing what the decision rules are and the value function are. 
not just today, but maybe in 2030 and 2040 in those later years. The key thing to remember is that if you're solving out for the problem today at today's state, then that's going to, you're also going to get the solution for the problem at some state in 2030 and then 2040 and 2050, et cetera. That then gives you data to use for approximating everything at those times. Now that might not be enough data, but then there are some other technical things I'm working on that um, basically allow you to produce data in an, in an efficient fashion for those other future times so that you can come up with decision rules and value functions for any time t in the future, even in a non-stationary model. By the way, a first rough draft of that is a paper of mine with Young Yang, uh, Tom Hertel, Yev Stein books. It's being, um, it's, it's on, I think it's on SSRN. Um, um, so look, if you just Google uh, Judd Kai Hertel Steinbucks, you'll hit the, that paper. That's where we take a, um, a shot at non-stationary problems. Um, and, but that, that paper needs a lot of editing. Um, but anyway, you, you see, basically you see the kind of ideas we're using there. So even though all my examples are stationary today, there's, that's not a limitation. If you have a non-stationary problem, that means that you have to compute value, a lot more value functions, decision rules, because there's going to be a different one at each period of time t. So yes, it's going to take more work. Of course, it's going to take more work. But again, um, one can uh, uh, do that in a very efficient fashion and take advantage of uh, massive uh, parallelization. There's another idea that is exposited in that paper. How would you, how could you simulate something like this or use simulation methods? And that's pretty straightforward. What you do is you start with some uh, state today. Some states are endogenous and under your control like capital stock and but maybe some states are exogenous like theta productivity and they may bounce around in an uncontrolled fashion. So one, one way to simulate this is to say you start at some state today, some capital stock today and some theta today, and then you proceed along the deterministic path for that and let the state, the capital and theta state evolve deterministically. But then at some time in the future, you, you have the theta state jump to something else, and then you now start solving deterministic problems um, from there. Um, but remember, it's certainly equivalent. So every time you're solving a dynamic optimization problem, you replace everything with every random variable with its expectation. But then occasionally you come along and say, okay, I wanna kick it around, and then um, you kick it around. Now, what's nice about that is that you will get a good estimate of where this problem lives. One of the problems in solving, one of the issues, difficulties in solving like, let's say the climate change problems such as my paper with Young Yang and <coughs> Tom, Thomas Lanchek in, that appeared in JPE in December, is you don't know what the domain is. You don't know <coughs> how broad the capital stock should be, et cetera. This simulation approach will answer that question. It will tell you where the problem lives. And then, um, then you can do your value function iteration, um, knowing what the domain is. And you might say, well, why do value function iteration on the stochastic problem? Well, what good was the NLCQ stuff? Well, the NLCQ stuff, tells you the domain of where the problem is going to live, gives you a very good approximation. And furthermore, you've already solved for decision rules and at various points and states. So then they are going to be good initial guesses for these optimization problems as you do value function iteration to, to tidy up 
the uncertain, the, the stochastic part. So, uh, and then this, I think this will turn out to be efficient because the guess and check method for the domain stuff is enormously costly because if it's wrong, you waste a lot of time and effort. And so this um, combining these two methods in this way could be enormously valuable. Now, um, as, the, as my marketing says, uh, the goal here is to kill off log linearization. Um, I'm sure I haven't succeeded in doing that. And I'm sure I'd have better chance talking about killing off COVID, but um, this, I, I do not see, okay. The way I describe this is that if you're doing log linearization as typically described in um, basic macro uh, texts, then this surely dominates it. Because what I'm doing is replacing the stochastic problem with the value function and decision rules for the deterministic problem. And I can do that using optimal control. I don't have to do value function iteration. And then I can use massive parallelism to solve you know, thousands or millions of optimal control problems um, and then use that to describe the deterministic value functions and decision rules and price functions, whatever. Whereas log linearization, standard log linearization just takes the deterministic model and then takes the local approximation of the deterministic model around the steady state and uses that globally. Surely this dominates that. Um, now, there are these other attempts to have global solutions. Um, they sometimes call themselves uh, uh, perturbation methods, but they really aren't. Um, now, by the way, higher order perturbation methods are also going to be inferior to this in most cases, because higher order perturbation methods will give you very accurate results, but only over the radius of convergence of the power series. And this approach allows you to solve the problem fairly efficiently and very accurately, even if you're outside the radius of convergence of the power series. So this is a big advantage of, uh, of over the higher order uh, perturbation methods that are out there that I've written about and others. So this and and this can take advantage of massive parallelism. So in the modern architectures, uh, this is uh, enormously superior. Now, any um, any other questions or comments? Um, Now, I suppose um, those of you who have done a lot of log linearization, um, uh, you might be inter might feel like you should go to these uh, bunkers that are in Switzerland that were not were built for World War II but weren't used. Um, anyway, but don't worry, I'm, I um, I have plenty of big shots to criticize for using log linearization. I'm not going to bother you guys. So um, um, my, my preference is to go after oh, Nobel Prize winners and wise men and other people like that. Um, and uh, oh, officials of the Fed. So anyway, but no, I, this given modern architecture, um, hardware and software, there's really no excuse for using um, log linearization. Now, what if you have kinks? The question. Uh, if you really have kinks, then you probably have to go to something like adaptive sparse grids. Now, you, we, we haven't talked about it, but I think many of you have heard of that jargon. Um, uh, but adaptive sparse grids would be the most um, powerful way to go. Now, and by the way, Simon Scheidegger, uh, along with another student of Felix's 
had a paper in Econometrica on that. Now, my other response to this question is that what you should first do is get rid of the kinks. For example, it's not the case that um, there's a zero lower bound. What, what happens really is that as you lower the interest rate, you have um, an increase in sort of the transaction costs of, <clears throat> of implementing that policy. And for example, you can go to uh, uh, interest rate being slightly negative and those costs are not going to be major. If you go too negative, then people are just going to take the cash and stick it in their mattress. Um, so basically what the monetary authority faces is a cost of implementation curve that can be viewed as being smooth. And so then um, you end up not with the optimal um, interest rate is not this max zero and something. It's actually some smoothing of that um, kink function. And so that's what should be done anyway. I, I, in, my, in my paper with uh, um, uh, of the Malyars on the EDS method, I had advocated for getting rid of the kink because that would make things go smoother. But they felt that, <clears throat> oh, because we want macroeconomists to read it, that we had to stay with the kink. Um, they might have been right in terms of that marketing. But in terms of substantive economics, if you're trying to solve very difficult problems and you see you have a kink, and then you tell yourself, well, does that kink really exist in the real world? And the answer is it doesn't. You can smooth it out. And then once you smooth it out, well, then, um, yeah, you've got lots of um, approximation methods that will handle it. Um, perhaps you might have to go to neural nets, maybe if it's a sharp kink or, you know, a very steep kink. But anyway, uh, if you have problems with kinks, first get rid of the kinks. Um, also, barring constraints are modeled as having a severe kink at zero assets. That's, that's bogus also. Um, so I don't think I've ever seen a problem. No, by the way, the one, <laughs> the one place where there are kinks is where uh, you have tax laws. And th those, are, those are real kinks. Now you may want to approximate them by smoothing them out. Um, but, um, uh, um, you know, you, these, these, you very rarely have um, re problems where the kinks cannot be smoothed out. And Brian is uh, quite right. Brian is right, has worked on these um, uh, issues. Uh, for a long time. In fact, um, uh, my, my sort of one of my motivations or one of my promptings for doing a lot of my work was reading Brian's work with Jeff Williams in the 1980s on solving problems like this. So uh, um, anyway, so the, the, the basic thing is you ask yourself, is the kink essential? And by essential, I don't mean, is it necessary in order to satisfy some idiot editor? I mean, if you're doing economics, is the kink essential for doing quality economics? Um, I know you, you guys have career concerns and all this kind of thing. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta suck up to those idiots. Um, I, I very, at my age, and um, I don't care about sucking up to those guys. So quality economics probably will tell you you should you you should get rid of the kinks. Um, okay, so thanks that thanks for the uh, Brian thanks for the note there. Um, any other questions?